bring in Laura Ingram onto the couch, hey who's been in the eye of the storm for the past, uh, I don't know, three weeks. I just came here for the push-ups. Oh, uh, no, right. right. You're a little late. Can you do them? Uh, yeah, I can do them. Are oh, uh, you oh, kidding? She's yeah. a college uh, softball player. I'm going to I'm gonna leave it to all the um, police out there and... Hank Seth was out there. He was, yeah. you know, I was like, come on. Like, he's like guns. Oh, man. no kidding. Right? Very Incredible. impressive. He's that's why we weren't How much doing time it? do you spend in the gym there, Pete? I mean, that's <laughs> a lot of hours. Right. All right. So <laughs> let's talk about what happened yesterday. Yep. Uh, do you think that it was, uh, this is something that really worked, bringing over the media It heads? was surprising. And it was first reported as a big blow up. Mm -hmm. And then, and so when you first read the New York Post and the Daily Beast, it was a blow up. But then you heard from other folks who said, Trump wasn't yelling at anyone. Yeah. He spoke in very measured tones, and he said, you guys didn't tell the truth about me, and I guess he said lied. But again, it's supposed to be off the record. Uh, but when you bring the press in and you say sure. off the record, and then you, you go after the press, you know they're all hurt egos. They're going to spill the beans. So, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the point was of that behind uh, closed doors Just dressing down. You got it but, wrong. Yeah, I always think of these meetings as what, what is, what's your ultimate goal? Absolutely. Sure. What's your ultimate goal of bringing all these people in? And a friend of mine uh, texted me and said, well, now they're just going to hate him more. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but you now Donald Trump's going to you know, make his own way with the press, and he's probably going to do a lot of those videos, I would imagine. Sure. Where it's straight to the American people, go around the press. That's like Twitter. Well, I mean, it worked. Yeah, it, yeah, it worked. Well, on Twitter this morning, uh, Donald Trump 45 minutes ago tweeted this. I canceled today's meeting with the failing New York Times when the terms and conditions of the meeting were changed at the last moment. Not nice. Apparently, they were going to have a, something off the record and then uh, on the record. Then he also wrote, perhaps a new meeting will be set up with the New York Times. In the meantime, they continue to cover me inaccurately and with a nasty tone. The New York Times' respond. They said, quote, we did not change the ground rules at, at all and made no attempt to. The ground rules were... It's going to be, some of it will be off the record, some of it will be on the record. Kelly and Conway was going to be there, Ryan Priebus and right. Ivanka. Well, I mean, I think that the, the best thing right now for the country is to see forward movement on these policies. I think once uh, President-elect Trump starts moving forward on tax uh, reform, enforcing this border, which is mm -hmm. a complete disaster from all the Border Patrol agents we're talking to at LifeSet, this this flow across the border is unprecedented Especially now right now because they're trying everyone's trying to get get across before i guess january 20th mm -hmm. do these policies i think the country's going to get better i think the economic landscape's going to get better there's going to be there's going to be actually more transparency about what's happening he's already telegraphing what he's going to do on executive order uh, rescinding on on moving forward with certain legislation really? he did that drilling all he's he, he's telling people what he's going to sure. do things are going to get better when things start getting better in the country I think a lot of this other stuff is going to kind of dissolve away. Not that the press is going to be less aggressive. They should be aggressive. Sure. I think the press, the, a, a press should be a check on all elected officials. They should have been tougher on Obama in the first 100 days. They weren't. They were, they were lavishly heaping praise on, on, on his burger runs. Remember every time he did a burger run mm -hmm. with Biden and Brian Williams in the back seat. Obama had his, had his feet up on the... Well, he uh, said he was in the back seat. We don't know. Oh, yeah, exactly. No, he was. The video was there. But it was the most fawning coverage of Barack Obama right. in the first 100 days. I'm not, I'm not expecting that. And I don't even think that's appropriate. But I think people are just looking for fairness, just general sense Absolutely. of fairness from the press. And you're right about transparency because he just goes straight to Twitter. And then yesterday he went straight to YouTube. He didn't call all the reporters and right, say, well. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do in my first 100 days. He set up a camera and a mm -hmm. teleprompter out at his golf club out in New Jersey. And this is what he had to say yep. about the next 100 days. I am going to issue our notification of intent to withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership a potential disaster for our country. Instead, we will negotiate fair bilateral trade deals that bring jobs and industry back onto American shores. On energy, I will cancel job-killing restrictions on the production of American energy, including shale energy and clean coal, creating many millions of high-paying jobs. On regulation, I will formulate a rule which says that for every one new regulation, two old regulations must be eliminated. On immigration, I will direct the Department of Labor to investigate all abuses of visa programs that undercut the American worker. On ethics reform, as part of our plan to drain the swamp, 
we will impose a five-year ban on executive officials becoming lobbyists after they leave the administration, and a lifetime ban on executive officials lobbying on behalf of a foreign government. These are just a few of the steps we will take to reform Washington and rebuild our middle class. I will provide more updates in the coming days as we work together to make America great again for everyone, and I mean everyone. So many times oh people get elected. Anything else? People get elected to jobs in Washington D.C. They go there, and then suddenly it's kind of like they've got amnesia. What did I say I was going to do? He's saying he would do that in part on the first day or at least the first hundred days. Right. I mean, he really is approaching this like this is this is a business plan. We, we formulated our business plan. We have to do the following eight things to be successful. It's a rollout. And, and, and it's, it's and, you know, maybe it'll be the road show. I mean, I think before the inauguration, you'll probably see yeah, President the victory Elect tour plan. Trump. He'll be going from the West Coast to the East Coast, being with actual Americans yeah. who are going to be affected all across the country from the West to the East by these policies and these changes. I think that video was really smart, yeah. really smart, because this is what I'm going to do. Now, it's on video. He's saying he's going to do this. If he doesn't do this, Problem. the press should hold him accountable. Sure. Right. But there will be compromises, I'm sure, on some, you know, some of the nuances of these policies. But he said, this is my goal. This is what I'm setting about he, to do. It's pretty about, refreshing. He talks about producing our own energy here in America. He says, right. through clean coal, through shale, we can do this. So we're not relying on other countries. And we can keep jobs here in America. Well, Huffington Post this morning, I'm Googling it, yeah. to find the articles, say what he's going to do in the first 100 days. Huffington Post pops up, and this is their headline. It's official. Donald Trump's first 100 days will be horrible for the planet. Well, they're the same people who said the economy probably would collapse when you know, the stock market would, would uh, fall into the ground. They wouldn't the stock cover market. him as a political candidate because they felt that he was a joke, remember? Right, so, so the Huffington Post is the Huffington Post. I don't, I don't think any of that matters. I'm just going to stick to what I was saying earlier. If he does these policies, bilateral trade that we can, we can change. If a bilateral trade agreement doesn't go our way and it's not helping Americans, we can alter it. With the TPP, you couldn't do that. You have 17 countries, and trying to alter that would bring hundreds of billions of dollars of penalties onto the, onto the American people and to the U.S. government. We can't do that. So, he said he wasn't going to do that, and he's not, which is really, really smart. So he's got a couple of things to do. Uh, repeal and replace Obamacare. Yeah. Do you need 60 votes? We'll debate about that. What does he have ready to go? It looks like the House is the closest thing with the official plan ready to go. Do you think he'll do that? Number two, do you think he's going to roll out a trillion-dollar infrastructure plan? Uh, and if so, how do you pay for it? Yeah, well, I think that the, the working with the Democrats on infrastructure is going to be something that conservatives are going to look at very carefully because we do have to pay for all this. Now, we, we do have to do some of this, too. I mean, there's no, sure. there's no ifs, ands, or buts. When, when bridges and roads are in the shape that they are in and some of the airports are in the shape that they're in, <coughs> JFK, sorry, uh, then we're, uh, you know, we have to do something about it. But I think Republicans, this is why we have a, an aggressive check in Congress. We have the House and the Senate and Republicans who campaign on fiscal responsibility. They have to hold the executive branch accountable, sure. and I think they should. So you're not happy with that $1 trillion? Well, interest. I think we, I think it has to be explained in a way that makes fiscal sense. Sure. If we're going to grow this economy, and I think this economy is going to move like a rocket ship over the next 18 months especially, you're going to see a movement in this economy across the board. That will bring in more tax revenue. We're going to repatriate money coming back into the United States that's been now offshored. That money is going to bring enormous growth to the sure. U.S. economy. So I think you're going to see higher tax receipts. But I think, I think it has to be responsibly done. Otherwise, you, you, you hurt yeah. your own narrative. So I think it's tough. I mean, replacing and repealing Obamacare is going to require the prescription drug companies yeah. in the country to you know, realize we have to be able to compete just like OECD countries get, get the lowest possible prices for drugs. Why don't the American people get that through Medicaid and Medicare? So the, there are a lot of things that have to be done to keep the prices of uh, health care down. The devil's in the details. All right. It's tough stuff. Great All to right. see you guys. Happy she, Thanksgiving. She's going to go run her radio show Yay. here in about 45 life minutes set. and life run set. Life Set as well. Exactly, guys. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank Today, I would like to provide the American people with an update on the White House transition and our policy plans for the first 100 days. Our transition team is working very smoothly, efficiently, and effectively. Truly great and talented men and women, patriots indeed, are being brought in, and many will soon be a part of our government, helping us to make America great again. My agenda will be based on a simple core principle, putting America first. And welcome back to Hannity. So President-elect Trump, he had a full schedule today, including a sit-down with former Texas Governor Rick Perry, among others. Now, earlier today, Trump's senior advisor, Kellyanne Conway, discussed the many meetings taking place. Let's take a look. 
Not everyone who has been interviewing with him and giving him advice and sharing their experiences and their vision for America, not all of them will be in his cabinet or be in his federal government, but they all are incredibly important in offering their points of view, their experience, and, and certainly their vision for the country. Now, it was also a busy weekend for President-elect Trump. He met with some high-profile people who may be considering for positions in his administration, including former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Also spotted was New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, who was an early Trump supporter, and retired Marine Corps General James Mad Dog Mattis, who is rumored to be a possible pick for Secretary of Defense, also met with Mr. Trump. But the meeting that got the most attention was with a former foe, the 2012 GOP candidate for the presidency, Mitt Romney. Here with reaction, former 2016 presidential candidate, Dr. Ben Carson, and editor-in-chief of Life's Zet, Fox News contributor, nationally syndicated radio host, Laura Ingram. Now, your name's out there a lot about a possible position. You're open to one. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like You're what I do. You're in New York, just by coincidence? I'm kind of like you, Sean. Sean, you and I, like, love what we do. We just we love, do. on a daily basis, it's such a privilege yeah. to talk to the American people and hear what they have to well, say. Well, they mentioned your name. I'm never considered well, for dog catcher. Well, that's because you're, you're, you're too rich, so you can't give away. I mean, you're just, too, be able you're to just pay. too rich. It's just, a, you know, the crumbs go for everybody else. No, I'm just, I'm just oh, kidding. Oh, thanks a lot. It's, fun, it's, it's, it's fun to be part of the mix, but look, I think they're doing other things that are frankly more important than uh, press secretary. And I am really worried. I think you'd be great, but I think it would drive you nuts. Tell me why. Because <laughs> those people are vicious. Yeah. And uh, look, and I, it would be entertaining because I don't think you'd take that crap. I would enjoy watching it. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, the American people are a little tired of the old game, the old press game. And I think they're on to the press people. I think they're on to the bias. Every poll shows that, and it's time. He doesn't. It's time. Need, why does any? Why do you have to go out and talk to them every day anyway? You don't. Well, he met with all these members of the press today, which I found kind of interesting. I mean, they they're the ones who messed up. He got it right, and they're the ones who messed up their analysis. They got the predict, predictions and projections wrong. Yeah, I think he's showing that he's very magnanimous. He sits down with uh, some folks in Fox. More gracious but, than I'd be. Yeah, I mean, George Stephanopoulos. I mean, most of these people just want to destroy him. And, and, oh, and, and they will. And, and, it, and that I'm not was even talking mission. about Stephanopoulos. I'm talking about, like, all these other, like, CNN, young producers and so NBC. forth. NBC. Yeah, so uh, we know what they're about. So I'm not sure kind of what the point is of having a big kibbutz. And I mean, maybe there's some point to it. I don't know. Maybe it's just making people feel better or included. I don't know. Dr. Carson, you had taken yourself out of consideration, but I heard you are reconsidering whether or not you might serve. Is that true? Well, uh, first of all, you know, what I've always said is that my preference is to work outside of the, the government because I think there's so many important voices that need to be heard that are outside of the bubble. Um, but I never said that I would not serve under any circumstances. What I've said is after they've gone through the process and if, if they conclude that, you know, my services would be essential, I would certainly give that serious consideration, as would any good American, I think. You know, Laura, a couple of people bothered me. I, I'm a Rudy fan, and I see that they're already attacking Sessions. I mean, he has oh, a stuff, great, Jeff, they, uh, Jeff Sessions, first great of all, civil rights record. Oh, he's, he's an amazing person. Amazing. He prosecuted the Klan, made right. sure that the Klan member got a death penalty. Right. Uh, you know, Rosa Parks, you know, uh, you know, Extended holiday. the Civil Rights Act it's, for 30 it, years, it, all I mean, of that. It's, 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 it was with John Lewis on the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday, the great right. photo, uh, you know, I tweeted out today. And I've known him for so long. And remember, one of the, the only vote that Arlen Specter said that he, he regretted, regretted. What before he uh, um, died was the only vote was voting against Jeff Sessions. That was after he became a Democrat. Why am I worried? Look, I thought, think to this day, Mitt Romney would have been a great president. Terrific. I yeah. really believe that. But I really, he called Trump a fraud, a huckster, and every other name, and actively worked against him. I, if Donald Trump chooses him, I think it is a huge mistake. I don't think uh, uh, someone who came out that vociferously and personally. Those it was personal. Those weren't substantive uh, 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 criticisms of Trump's trade or immigration or tax reform. That's one thing. I, I frankly don't even agree with that. If you're a Republican and you're, everyone played for you and rallied to you and I, rallied to Romney and, and helped him as much as we could, but that it was so nasty. Personal. And it was quoted, how many times was Mitt Romney played in a Hillary, Hillary ad. Clinton ad? And so I guess, you know, have people in and I mean, I guess it, it's magnanimous and gracious, but th I think loyalty and competence and an ability to, you know, I think 
advocate on behalf of these issues. Really important. Right, we got one more. I'm very confident uh, that uh, the president-elect and his extraordinary talented family are going to work with the best legal minds in this country and create uh, the, the proper separation uh, from their business enterprise uh, during his duties as president of the United States. What I can assure you and all of your viewers is that all of the laws uh, pertaining to his business dealings and his service as president of the United States will be strictly adhered to. That comment from Vice President-elect Mike Pence coming in the aftermath of a report in the Argentinian newspaper La Nación, among uh, many other sources, that said that during a congratulatory phone call with the president of Argentina, Trump apparently brought up this issue of a high-rise that he's building there, asking the president to expedite uh, some of the uh, process of, of bringing that uh, construction to a, a finish. Now, after that report, apparently the newspaper, as well as the president of Argentina and the Trump transition team, denied that the conversation ever took place. But it produced a heated exchange between a New York Times reporter and Kelly Ann Conway today at Trump Tower. Let's listen into that. There's some reports that Mr. Trump continues to transact business while he conducts Is that appropriate? And is that an appropriate use of his time? And are you confident that he is not breaking any laws? I'm very confident he's not breaking any laws. He has many lawyers, accountants, and advisors who tell him what he must do and what he can't do. And he's a bit, he's a businessman. He is also working a transition. He's the president elect. And you know we're in unprecedented times. We have someone who is very successful. How long is he going to continue to do both, to be president elect and to run his own business? Well, I mean, it's not. It's not like he's. Did you ask people how long are you going to play golf and do the transition? Well, let's bring in our panel now. Daniel Halper of the New York Post. Also, Susan Page, Washington bureau chief at USA Today, and syndicated columnist at Charles Krauthammer. Dan, let's start with you. When does he cease becoming a businessman, if he still is, and becoming a president? Well, it probably should have happened about yesterday, uh, or when he got elected. Look, what was the knock against Hillary Clinton? Is that she was crooked, that she benefited off of the state, off of her, off of her service in government and her family? And that was crooked Hillary, right? That's what Donald Trump called her throughout the campaign, and he obviously was very successful in doing so. He needs to be careful now going forward that any appearance of conflict of interest will be held against him, will be questioned, mm -hmm. and reporters will ask what is going on if this is not dealt with properly in the next you know, during the transition period. This is a very pivotal time for him and his business because it, it will really shape, you know, there's a, just a few blocks from here and from the White House there's a Trump hotel. There was a report over the weekend that diplomats are staying or have been feel pressure to stay at that hotel. Those sorts of things could dog him throughout his presidency if he's not able to deal with it at this moment. And Susan, this is all complicated by the fact that his children are the, the Trump uh, business partners as well. So it's virtually impossible them, for them to not know who he's negotiating with as president. How does he extricate himself from this relationship? I think it's, I think it's so complicated. It's so unprecedented. We've never had a, a president this wealthy or one with this kind of empire, an empire that bears his name and his children are going to run it. So the possibility of the kind of blind trust that past presidents have done is simply not an option here. I think it's going to be a continuing issue that he'll need to address uh, day by day, week by week. It's not as though he's going to stop being Trump. And the Trump industry, the Trump network, uh, the, the Trump empire is not going to go away. They're going to have to figure out ways to proceed with the family business that his kids are going to run in a way that reassures Americans that he's not mixing that with the public's business. Charles? I don't think it can be done. I don't think this is a complicated problem. I think this is an insoluble problem. First of all, we've never had a president withholding so um, widespread around the world. Second. As he himself has said in many of the depositions he's done over the years, the value of his company fluctuates according to perception. And the main element of the values of a lot of his properties has to do with his name. Many of them are not his, they're just, they slap his name on and the value increases and he gets a payment. So the idea, what you would normally do is you sell everything because you can't have a blind trust for a business that's so visible. You have to sell everything, but that, of course, would impact the value. It would be a fire sale. 
he would never do that. He spent his entire life constructing this extremely closely held empire that all re revolves around him and reflects him. It would require him to, to basically look back on the 30 years of his life he built this and to say, that's over forever. I'm now going to liquidate my holdings, and from now on I'm president and president only. Unless he does that, there is no answer to this. And every time he makes a phone call to a head of state where he has a business interest, there will be questions. And the chances of that actually happening? Close to zero. But then again, I said that about his chances of winning the presidency. <laughs> right. So take that with a grain of salt. Okay. Uh, another development just within the half hour or so, Donald Trump released his executive action plan for day one. Let's take a look at some of the, the bullet points here. On the issue of trade, he plans to issue a notification of intent to withdraw from the TPP and instead negotiate fair bilateral trade deals. On the subject of energy, cancel job killing restrictions on the production of American energy, including Shell energy. On the subject of regulation for Every one new regulation, two old regulations must be eliminated. National security. Ask the Department of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to develop a comprehensive plan to protect America's vital infrastructure from cyber attacks. On immigration, direct the Department of Labor to investigate all abuses of visa programs that undercut, undercut the American worker. And lastly, on ethics reform, impose, and this gets to our first uh, discussion of the day, impose a five-year ban executive on executive officials becoming lobbyists after they leave the administration and a lifetime ban on executive officials lobbying on behalf of a foreign government. Reaction, Daniel, we'll start with you. Well, I think it must be a heartening sign if you're a Trump supporter because it shows that he's organized, that he's uh, he has thought about his administration at this point, and he's looking, you know, we, we see this very public process of him bringing people up to Trump Tower. He's interviewing people for cabinet positions. Donald Trump, as Dan Quayle said on uh, mornings with, or I guess Sunday Futures with Maria Bartiromo over the weekend, Dan Quayle said something to the effect that he has basically 100 or 200 days, basically until about July, in order to enact what he wants to get done. And if he comes in organized and he doesn't fight and he doesn't lead unnecessary fights over his cabinet, then he'll be able to get a lot of things done that he promised on immigration, on TPP, on trade, on all these things. And if he comes, but if he don't, comes disorganized and if he fights unnecessarily so over various appointments or people he might name, mm -hmm. then he won't be able to get those things done. So it's got to be a heartening sign if you're a Trump fan. Susan? Well, not really a surprise, these uh, proposals, mostly things he enumerated in that speech he gave it at Gettysburg before the election. The, the idea that he's backing out of TPP on day one, that's new. And there's some supporters of the trade deal that had held out hopes that maybe they could convince him it was a good idea. That clearly is not going to happen. I think also the, the lobbying ban is an interesting thing because one of the most powerful things for President Obama when he came in was to try to address some of this culture of Washington stuff that alarms a lot of voters. And it's interesting if Trump really tackles that in a serious way, not letting people who serve in his administration ever lobby for a foreign government and banning them from lobbying for five years after they leave uh, government employment. That is a serious restriction. Mm -hmm. Charles. I think it's a good list. It shows, I agree, how serious he is about some of the things he campaigned on. Uh, I think the TPUP is a little bit regrettable. It's sort of like uh, Obama's Guantanamo. It's a fixed idea. It's not going to change. There's no way he would be in favor of the TPP, but I think we're going to see the cost of that rise as those Pacific allies of ours, including even Australia, are now going to seek their own deals with China as a result. We may live to regret that. The, the so it, it empowers China? Absolutely. The Chinese are the ones who are the biggest beneficiaries of the death of a TPP. And, but lastly, what's not on the list? What's interesting is I would have expected the executive order Obama had signed to legalize the five million illegal aliens that is, are being held up in the court, so there's no real urgency. But if you wanted to show decisiveness, you would cancel that on day one. I think you will eventually, but I'm just surprised it wasn't on the list. It would, be, would, it would send a real statement had he did it, were he to do it uh, in the very first hour. So everybody's talking about Hamilton. As you know, Mike Pence takes his family to the play. There's some booing from the audience. The cast members read this lecture going after the new administration. This is all anti-Donald Trump. And I must say, 
Pence was very gracious about it, said he wasn't offended, whereas Donald Trump, a little bit more confrontational, said he wanted an apology. There's something much bigger going on here than what I saw as the rudeness of going after a guy in the audience less than two weeks after an election. They haven't taken office yet, and now you have the cultural icons of this country, not just the cast of Hamilton, but Gigi Hadid, this um, prominent model at the American Music Awards, doing a really, I would say, mean impersonation of Melania Trump, mocking her accent and her demeanor. What did Melania do to deserve this? She's not somebody who really seeks the political spotlight. And so in these inappropriate venues, you have, you know, the, these liberal entertainers, you know, kind of trying to pander to their base by saying, we don't like Donald Trump. We just had an election. 60 million people voted for Donald Trump. I get the fact that many uh, in the country and the media and entertainment elsewhere are not happy about that. So go ahead and criticize Trump, uh, oppose his policies, uh, criticize his appointees. All that is fine. But when you drag in Broadway and when you drag in music awards, it really kind of sends a signal that you don't really care that there was just an election. You are uh, so viscerally opposed to Trump, who hasn't even done anything yet. He's still just the president-elect uh, that you uh, are going to uh, renounce him. And it goes to this question I raised the other day about those in the media who say we should normalize Trump. You know, forget the fact that he won the election. We can't normalize him. We can't treat him as just any other president because we are so viscerally opposed to him. You see, uh, it's also interesting to watch the transition coverage. Um, you know, Donald Trump has had lots and lots of people auditioning for jobs coming to Trump Tower over the weekend at his golf course in New Jersey. Uh, so at first, the complaint from the mainstream media was, well, Trump's not moving quickly enough. Why hasn't he made more appointments? Uh, then it was pointed out that, you know, actually he's at least on par and slightly ahead of the pace of some previous president. So now, according to the New York Times and others, it's a spectacle. You know, uh, all these people coming and, they're, and rather than doing this in secret, they're being quite open about the fact that, uh, you know, whether it's uh, Mitt Romney or Rudy Giuliani uh, and others, uh, Mad Dog Mattis, isn't it fitting that a general with the name Mad Dog might be part of this administration? Um, you know, they're doing it quite openly. Uh, and, and as the president-elect who, who doesn't have a long background in politics, who doesn't have a government in exile, who genuinely wants to meet some of these people and fi feel out, uh, figure out who would work best in those cabinet positions and in the White House itself. So now it's a spectacle, it's a show, it's The Apprentice. Um, talk about can't win. Now, again, I'm fine with criticizing, you know, whether it's Jeff Sessions at the Justice Department or Michael Flynn for National Security Advisor, you know, deal with facts, deal with the merits. But if you're going to say, uh, gee, uh, Trump is making everybody come and kiss his ring. Well, you know, there are always versions of this with a new president. It's just whether you kind of do it semi-publicly or whether you have secret meetings as Barack Obama did uh, uh, with Hillary Clinton in some secret building at the airport so nobody would know and you could spring it as a surprise. Now, I, it is interesting that Donald Trump hasn't yet held a news conference, uh, that he... Um, hasn't gone out and given any speeches, that he's basically devoting all his time uh, to assembling a government. Because you'd think he'd want to be a little more public. I mean, this is a guy who feeds off the crowds and the energy and all of that. But at the same time, Trump knows something. You know, in January, February, and March, a year from now, nobody is going to care how long he took to pick his top appointees or whether it was done in secret or whether it became something of a reality show. What they will care about is whether he picked good people uh, to staff this new administration. Uh, and so if he wants to devote most of his time right now to drilling down on making those picks and not performing so much on the public stage, I think he's entitled to do that. I, I just have the impression that the deeper we get into this transition, the people in the media, in entertainment, and just in the country who didn't want Trump to win, who thought he wasn't going to win, uh, who, who, was in, who were envisioning a Hillary Clinton presidency, on some level they need not to suddenly be behind Donald Trump, but at least to accept him as the 45th president and to say that while we'll oppose him on things we disagree on, it would be nice if he succeeded on behalf of the country. Don't you think? 
I think any transition is going to be a little rocky. There's been rockiness here. I think, though, the very public meetings, or at least the public entrances, have really been genius as PR because it just creates a sense of movement. It gives something the media, uh, something for the media to fasten on, rather than the kind of all the insidery bickering you always get in any transition. All right, Obamacare was not mentioned. Neither was the wall. Peter Ducey just referred to it. What do you think about that? Obamacare repeal will happen in the first couple of months. This is something that he's completely committed to, and just as importantly, the Republican Congress is utterly committed to. Paul Ryan is working this as we speak. The wall, I don't think there'll be a wall across the entire border. He's kind of admitted that now, but the enforcement agenda will happen. Well, what he has said is that some areas are mountainous and they could require a fence. As for this meeting with the media executive yesterday, uh, it was off the record. Uh, I don't know what happened with the New York Times, but apparently a lot of the folks who attended yesterday's meeting took a lot of heat because it was off the record. Now, so they're reacting to that. Perhaps what the New York Times says we can do this, but it's got to be on the record. It is true that any administration, they have these off the record meetings all the time. What do you make of this back and forth? Rich? There's nothing wrong with the media sitting down with newsmakers, let alone the president elect of the United States on the off the record basis. So I don't get there being any problem there. But look, the media. The media declared war on Donald Trump several months ago, and it took a shot at the king, and it missed. And it's now paying a price, and of course Donald Trump is going to point out to them that they were wrong. But this re relationship has been hostile and testy from the beginning, and probably will only get more so. So everybody's talking about Hamilton. As you know, Mike Pence takes his family to the play. There's some booing from the audience. The cast members read this lecture going after the new administration. This is all anti-Donald Trump. And I must say, Pence was very gracious about it, said he wasn't offended, whereas Donald Trump, a little bit more confrontational, said he wanted an apology. There was something much bigger going on here than what I saw as the rudeness of going after a guy in the audience less than two weeks after an election. They haven't taken office yet, and now you have the cultural icons of this country, not just the cast of Hamilton, but Gigi Hadid, this um, prominent model at the American Music Awards, doing a really, I would say, mean impersonation of Melania Trump, mocking her accent and her demeanor. What did Melania do to deserve this? She's not somebody who really seeks the political spotlight. And so in these inappropriate venues, you have, you know, the, these liberal entertainers, you know, kind of trying to pander to their base by saying, we don't like Donald Trump. We just had an election. 60 million people voted for Donald Trump. I get the fact that many uh, in the country, in the media, and entertainment, and elsewhere are not happy about that. So go ahead and criticize Trump, uh, oppose his policies, uh, criticize his appointees, all that is fine. But when you drag in Broadway and when you drag in music awards, it really kind of sends a signal that you don't really care that there was just an election. You are uh, so viscerally opposed to Trump, who hasn't even done anything yet. He's still just the president-elect, uh, that you uh, are going to uh, renounce him. And it goes to this question I raised the other day about those in the media who say we should normalize Trump. You know, forget the fact that he won the election. We can't normalize him. We can't treat him as just any other president because we are so viscerally opposed to him. You see, uh, it's also interesting to watch the transition coverage um, you know, Donald Trump has had lots and lots of people auditioning for jobs coming to Trump Tower over the weekend at his golf course in New Jersey. Uh, so at first, the complaint from the mainstream media was, well, Trump's not moving quickly enough. Why hasn't he made more appointments? Uh, then it was pointed out that, you know, actually he's at least on par and slightly ahead of the pace of some previous presidents. So now, according to the New York Times and others, it's a spectacle. You know, uh, all these people coming, and, they're, and rather than doing this in secret, they're being quite open about the fact that, uh, you know, whether it's uh, Mitt Romney or Rudy Giuliani uh, and others, uh, Mad Dog Mattis, isn't it fitting that a general with the name Mad Dog might be part of this administration? Um, you know, they're doing it quite openly, uh, and, and as the president-elect who, who doesn't have a long background in politics, who doesn't have a government in exile, who genuinely wants to meet some of these people and fi feel out, uh, figure out who would work best in those cabinet positions and in the White House itself. So now it's a spectacle, it's a show, it's The Apprentice. Um, 
talk about can't win. Now, again, I'm fine with criticizing, you know, whether it's Jeff Sessions at the Justice Department or Michael Flynn for National Security Advisor, you know, deal with facts, deal with the merits. But if you're going to say, uh, gee, uh, Trump is making everybody come and kiss his ring. Well, you know, there are always versions of this with a new president. It's just whether you kind of do it semi-publicly or whether you have secret meetings as Barack Obama did uh, uh, with Hillary Clinton in some secret building at the airport so nobody would know and you could spring it as a surprise. Now, I, it is interesting that Donald Trump hasn't yet held a news conference, uh, that he... Um, hasn't gone out and given any speeches, that he's basically devoting all his time uh, to assembling a government. Because you'd think he'd want to be a little more public. I mean, this is a guy who feeds off the crowds and the energy and all of that. But at the same time, Trump knows something. You know, in January, February, and March, a year from now, nobody is going to care how long he took to pick his top appointees or whether it was done in secret or whether it became something of a reality show. What they will care about is whether he picked good people uh, to staff this new administration. Uh, and so if he wants to devote most of his time right now to drilling down on making those picks and not performing so much on the public stage, I think he's entitled to do that. I, I just have the impression that the deeper we get into this transition, the people in the media, in entertainment, and just in the country who didn't want Trump to win, who thought he wasn't going to win, uh, who, who, was in, who were envisioning a Hillary Clinton presidency, on some level they need not to suddenly be behind Donald Trump, but at least to accept him as the 45th president and to say that while we'll oppose him on things we disagree on, it would be nice if he succeeded on behalf of the country. Don't you think?